So in talking about the city, um, we're talking about the current city, the contemporary city, and where the city may go in the future. For urban planners, for communities, um, for politicians, for business people, the future of the city is a very pressing question, and there are many people who address it in many, many different ways. What I want to focus on today is two little concepts which perhaps aren't very often brought together um, into the one discussion. That is the question of quality, the kind of place a city is, what, what's the spirit of a city, what makes it up, but also the scale. And I, when I say scale, I don't mean just the size of it, I, I mean the unity of the place, what makes up the whole of the city. So it's got to do with balance, it's got to do with its appropriateness in terms of size, in terms of the way it's laid out, um, and so on. So if you think of a city like Caracas, for example, and if you look at it in its morphology, look at the way its footprint sits on the earth, you can read quite a lot into it. You can read a pattern there. You can see how different densities of building occur in different parts of the city. You can see some very formalized layouts, probably some boulevards, some grand squares, maybe some monuments to the, the, the founding fathers of the city. Um, you can see where um, perhaps places are more informal, where slum dwellers live. Um, where, where the diplomats live. And you can see, or get a sense at least, of the arteries that run through it, the communication arteries, the transportation arteries, and so on. It, it's not an, an accident that when we talk about cities that we use terms like the, the, the terms we use for the human body. We, we talk about arteries, we talk about the throbbing heart of the city. Um, and so what I'm asking you to do to think about in terms of the quality and the scale of the city, to try and think of it in, in, in the unity uh, as the whole. We never t talk nowadays in terms of health about just the health of the heart or of the lungs or of the, or of the feet um, or of simply me mental or emotional health. We talk about the whole body. And I think if we can think about the city as its entirety um, and how the different elements link to one another, we can get a sense of what's going on. So, for example, if we think about the people who have written about cities, the artists, the musicians, the poets, the people who have embodied somehow the city as a piece of music, a beautiful symphony, um, a poem, a, a painting. Um, we can find ways of describing the city that um, often don't have exact words on them. Um, and sometimes those, those senses of the city aren't about beauty, they're about squalor. We, we talk about um, th the evils of the city, the dark satanic mills of, of, of London in the time of the, of the Industrial Revolution. Um, but equally, we can talk about uh, the beauty, the balance, um, the, the at-oneness of a city that really works. And we all know those places. We've been to places where we feel just right. Um, and that's what I mean by quality. I don't just mean the quality of the paving, or whether there's litter around, or whether the architects have painted the buildings very beautifully. I th I'm talking about this general sense of balance, or um, an intrinsic comf comfort that you get in a place that really works. And sometimes it's how you respond to the city. This, this picture is a, a drawing by a, a teenager in, in the 1970s who was trying to embody what Cork means. And at that time, people were worried about pollution. They were worried about, are we going to destroy our city simply by uh, litter and pollution and squalor and, and things of that kind? Um, but equally, we can think of this about the city in many different ways. Um, and in a short 30 years, now our sense of the urban environment is much more sophisticated. We now take a lot of care about our, our urban spaces, about the edges of buildings, about streets, about streetscape, um, and all of the different complementary uses, about trees, about green areas, and so on. There's, there's, a, there's been a sea change in the way we look at the city in terms of quality. But I'd like to say something about scale as well. The scale of the How big is a city? Like, what, what is Cork, for example? Um, how big is it? Where does it stop and where does it start? We know that Cork is Ireland's second city. We know that it's the real capital. Um, but how could we possibly draw our arms around it? Could, draw, could we draw um, a shape, a polygon, into which we could hold the city? Could, is there a vessel in which we could hold the city, for example? Um, so we have to start somewhere and to try and conceptualize uh, where is the city and what does it um, constitute. There's a very famous drawing um, dating back to the um, beginning of the, the 1900s from uh, um, Patrick Geddes. It's called the Valley Section. It's the one in which, well before we understood about the ecology, of the city, or well before we understood about environmental politics. It was the one where we knew that the city belongs in the region. The region which produces the food, which produces the raw materials for the industry, which, um, from which the, the migrants come to make the city productive. This city in the region 
is the scale that we're talking about. So metropolitan Cork now, for example, um, is a place of pushing on 350,000 people. It's, it's quite a substantial city in European terms. It's not a little remote place on the edge of Europe. Um, it's a city that sits in a, a wonderfully preserved green belt, so that not very many places from the city and its satellite suburbs are far from open countryside. Um, and when you think about the sprawling cities of other parts of the world, you'll see how lucky we are, we are in a place like this. So when people write about the city, urban geographers, politicians, political scientists, ecologists, there's so many different terms that you can, you can draw on. We read about the planet of slums, we read about the just city, um, a concept um, of Susan Feinstein who writes about equality and equity in the city, not to be confused with the fair city, which I think is a TV program. Um, we talk about the green and ecological city. We talk about the city of postmodern collapse, you know, the city of uh, alienation. Um, and there's so many different perspectives on the city. Let's just look at the question of size, scale, and quality of places. In any city, when we try to read it, there are many, many clues there already. There are little, little things, little signs to say that this city isn't anywhere else, it's just this unique place. The same way as if you look at a person, they've got their own little characteristics, they've got their own little ways of doing things, and we can read the city if we're attentive to it. Little tricks of the trade um, in the designers, things that have happened organically, things that have happened by accident, and these are the things that give us a sense of quality or a sense of vibrancy that makes a place different from, from other places. And in reading the city, we also have to say, well, how do people encounter it? If you're um, a, a, a business person who is promoting foreign direct investment and you've flown in to see whether the city is a place to, to, to invest in, uh, in your business, you will read the city probably quite differently from somebody who's a migrant, somebody who finds it difficult to get around because of mobility impairment. A child, how does a child see a city? How does a motorist see the city differently from a, from a cyclist? What are the signs that the city gives to say that it's a welcoming place, a place that you can do business, a place that you can be in um, and live and be healthy in every sense? So when I use the word the healthy city, yes, I'm concerned with the health of the people who live there. I'm concerned with the, the mental health, the physical health and the well-being of the people who live there. But in a way, the city as an organism itself can be healthy or unhealthy. It can be ailing. It might need a little bit of our help every now and then. Okay, there are a few signs we know from, um, um, from, uh, from practice, I suppose, that say how you can read the city. Uh, Kevin Lynch, who is a famous American urban designer, and well, I suppose he's written the Urban Design 101, perhaps for an American audience, but he, he's identified four things um, which uh, uh, help us to read the city, and one is paths. How you get through the place, how permeable is it? When you go through it, do you feel safe? Do you get a sense of where you're going? Um, and do you know where you are at any one time? It, ma it makes it legible and readable for you. Um, and we know that the path, the place that brings us comfortably from one part of the city to the other can be, can be pleasant, they can be uh, places where you can have chance encounters, they can be green, they can be peaceful, they can be hectic, they can be vibrant, and so on. So these paths are an important element of reading the city. Um, and whether you actually have signposts or whether you just have um, a sense of where you're going, um, this is about reading and being legible. There's another sense um, about reading the city which has to do with edges. You know, where does the start city finish and when, where does it begin? Are there places where the city starts to diffuse into places that we don't quite understand? Is this kind of a place that um, some people in, 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 in the literature call the geography of nowhere? You know, the kind of things that say it's, it's everything but it's really nowhere because you can't get a sense of where you are. And edges is another one of those senses. So you know, look, just at the edge of here, I've got a, a lake, I've got a river, I've got an open space in which I can recreate and try and get back some of my humanity from the, the, the cut and thrust of life in the, in the, in the, in the urban centre. The third one is nodes. There are places, individual crossing places, places where people meet, the, um, the places where highways meet, the places where people meet, the places where commerce meets, the people where, where people protest, the pe places where people um, exercise their, their, their citizenship, let's say. And this each city, each successful city, manages to um, link these nodes together in a particular kind of way to make it work well. It's like, I suppose, those, those parts, the chakras, you call them perhaps in the body, that says these are the nerve centers, the individual places that work. Um, so the nodes are places that we recognize when we're in a particular place, we know we're there, um, and we know its function. 
Um, another one is landmarks. What is it about the sprawling suburb that tells us we're not really sure where we are? This kind of nowheresville sense. Um, and it's about you know, something to help us read it, something to help us get where we want to go. It might be a long way to the Eiffel Tower, but if I keep ambling in this direction, I'll get there because I can see it in the distance. And Cork is a superb city for that. If you think about the landmarks that are there, the physical landmarks, not just the, um, the churches and the steeples are, of course, everywhere, um, but also the trees. Think about the plane trees on UCC campus, for example. Um, think about the stadiums that come along um, and, and, and orient you when you're, where you, when you're in a city, the railway stations, sometimes even the pylons, um, the things, the water towers that get you here or there, or the, or the air traffic control tower in the airport, for example. Um, and the last element is districts. There are different districts in a place. Think about Paris. Where would it be without the arrondissement, the places that are quite different from everywhere else? Uh, we know that we're in one district when we're not in another district. And it brings it down to a human scale, the scale that you can relate to. How do you relate to a city on the scale of Sao Paulo? You, you know, um, the districts are part of this, which bring it back to the scale of the human um, and, and where you can live in a particular place. And it also allows the city to breathe, because in between the districts, the paths, and the landmarks, you can find um, a place um, for, 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 for recreation as well. And finally, it's the interaction between all of these different elements which makes it complicated and interesting to see how you manage or create a city. The interrelationships are, let's say, um, the dynamic th the thing that makes one city different from another one. And in a way, the rules or the, or the, the language of making these places, it's a language that we need to learn. Um, and many people don't speak that language very well, although they have a gut sense that they know. Um, it's a bit like somebody listening to music. They, they know how they respond to the music. They might not be able to play it or write it, but they know when it's right. And similarly, if we can read the city in the same way, um, then we're well on the way to understanding it. Um, quality. Now, quality is a much more complicated thing, but at the, uh, in another sense, it's much more immediate. Christopher Alexander, who is a, um, a writer in urban design, he calls it the quality without a name, because he looks at places that are successful, places that work well, places that are harmonious, places that, you know, really they're the kind of places we want to make, the places that we need to imitate if we don't want to make the mistakes of, of the past particularly in the modern era, when we, when we lost that sense of organic city building. So he calls it this quality which cannot be named. But having said that, like any architect, he goes ahead to try and name it. Um, and if, if you think about it, um, you can make an attempt to say, well, what makes a place right? And one of these is that it's, it's quite a precise place. You know, if, if you're talking about a city for commerce, business people need something exact. They need some certainty. They need to know What's the purpose of this particular city? They need to know, is there a population of educated people to work in, in our industry, for example? Or they need to know, what's the return on my investment? They, they need a degree of certainty and preciseness and precision. Um, but similarly, in the same way as, 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 as a pot or a bowl has been made out of our organic materials, it's got a shape to it. Um, if a piece is missing, we'll know straight away it loses its function. So you know, this concept of being exact and whole is a helpful way of describing the quality of, of a good place. It also has to be alive. It's not just enough to have a city that looks well and is, I is pretty um, and is self-contained. It also has to have things happen in it. You have to be able to, to be in that city. And the places that are alive aren't always the most beautiful. <laughs> They're often the ones that give you a surprise. You turn the corner and you, you get a surprise, some, some sense of delight in the city. Um, and, but describing it as alive itself isn't enough to get to that quality. There's more than just it being alive. It also has to have a degree, as I said, of, 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 of precision. It has to have a degree of being able to, to live and to be free. A city that's stuck in time, a city that's stuck in some uh, historical time warp, um, it doesn't continue to live or to breathe. Um, the city also must be a, pl be a place for children. It's not something that people write about very often. Um, Brendan Gleeson, who's an, uh, an Australian academic who writes on, on geography and city planning, he makes an appeal to us to look at the city uh, from the, chil the child's perspective. We talk about new urbanism, new city quarters, mixed uses, higher density. Um, it's great for the young, young professional who wants to live in the city where, with all the cafes and the bars and all the meeting, meetings that go on in their lifestyle. But is it suitable for the city? Unfortunately, the child really is catered better for in the suburbs. And the, but the suburbs are places that are very difficult to read in terms of city planning. It's also alive in ter terms of the culture. 
in terms of ent entertainment, in, in terms of making the street alive, in, make, in terms of um, letting the city live and let the people take on. Now, there's corporate interpretations of that as well. We've heard of European capitals of culture. We've heard of um, you know, having very highly managed festival cities um, which exclude certain members of the, of, of, of the community. But it also has to be allowed to, to be live in a slightly, um, slightly um, more nervy let's sort, sort of way, a place that people can claim the city if necessary. Um, also, when you're reading the city, you have to get a sense of its hinterland. Um, and when you get to the edge of what we consider the central part of a city, we get to places that are hard to read. What's the nature of these places? And it's often associated with the suburbs. Um, do these places have got, do they have a fabric? Do they live? Are they just places for people to sleep? When we bring in new buildings and new interventions in a, in a historic place, are these relevant to our lifestyle and the way we, we, we want to, to use them? What about the spaces that are left over? We all know them, the little bits in the middle of the city that are partly disused, they're partially derelict, but something is going on there. You know, kids play there at the weekends. Um, sometimes artists will take over these places and use them. Um, every living, breathing, vibrant city needs these little places. They don't have to be perfectly orderly. And we know that the comfortable city, like the comfortable set of clothes, doesn't have to be very stylish. Sometimes it can be quite shabby. And that's, there's a degree of shabbiness which works in the good city as well. Also, at the edge of the city, and this is particularly important in Cork, that the city sits in its hinterland, in its rural hinterland, in a particularly unique way. And that has been planned for. It's not an accident that Cork City doesn't sprawl suburb into suburb into suburb into suburb. These green wedges, these little strategic gaps between the, 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 the different towns and districts are very deliberate. And big choices have to be made. If we were to keep the health of the city, to keep these green spaces, to make sure that the place doesn't merge into one big amorphous mass, we have to make decisions about these places. It will become more urgent when we know how important food will become to us in the years to come. When we try to re, um, replace agriculture in the city in years to come, we will have the difficulty of the, uh, the rooftops of, uh, of Boston and New York. We don't have that now. We have the luxury of planning it in advance. If our, the future of our workplaces are going to be places designed on green fields, on the edge of the city, accessed only by the motorway, we're beginning to lose our facility to speak the language of good design and good place making. These places are special because they're not built on. They don't have to have a, an important habitat there. They don't have to have an outstandingly beautiful landscape, but they feed and nourish the places around it. Cork is a small city in many respects. It grew up on the, on the edge of the River Lee. You can see the beautiful River Lee Valley that's been flowing to the, towards the east into Cork Harbour, one of the greatest natural harbours around. Um, and around the city centre, which we know is historic, um, and, and very beautiful, we have this um, thing called the city, city council area. But as we know, climate doesn't respect legal boundaries. We know biodiversity doesn't respect legal boundaries. We know that health doesn't respect legal boundaries. So, for example, the real footprint of the city is sometimes not contiguous with the legal boundary of the city. And, in fact, the operational city, this city of between 300 and 350,000 people, is a metropolis that's a necklace of interlaced settlements, places, industrial locations, places to live, places to study, and so on. It's a whole. It's like an entire a body, a symphony, uh, something that pulls together. So in completion, I would say Cork is a place that we should study because it shows how both scale and quality and standard of placemaking can come together extremely well. And in using Alexander's language again, it's alive, it's whole, as long as we stick to the line of not making tough decisions, that it's comfortable, free, and eternal in to some sense. So reading the scale and quality of the city is a challenge for everybody, but it's, it's well within our, our compass, and we've got a great laboratory in which to do it. Thank you. Thank you.